It says in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Basically what this saying is that there is a problem. And the problem is not that God is not speaking. The problem is that people are not listening. <laughs> I've said it time and time again. I have preached on this multiple times, but I feel like God is speaking to my heart this morning, and I want to just kind of maybe remind us that there is not a shortage of word being spoken over our lives. But there is a shortage of us hearing God's word as he is speaking it. <laughs> Let me say it this way. In the manner in which he is speaking it. You would be surprised at the people that open up their Bible throughout their week and they hear a word, but they don't hear the word in the context that God is speaking it to and in. We have become professional at taking God's word and using it as a way to make our week better. And, and much of the word, if I'm being completely candid with you, the word is not to make your week better, it's to make you better. And in order us to be formed more into his image, we have to die to ours. So reading God's word the way that he intended is that every time we open his word, your flesh man, you, you would, be, would die and be put to death that his life may be lived through you. How many of you can admit today that Jesus did it better? <laughs> That's good. Jesus did it better. If Jesus did not do it better, then that means that you can do it without him. And we know that's not true, right? We all know that we need Jesus here today, but it is interesting because we have people living a life and they live a, such a life that they believe that they can do it good all by themselves. Now, many of you here today be like, I actually, I, I don't think I can do it all by myself. Then my question is, how come you keep doing it your way and not God's way? See how I tricked you there? Isn't that just mean? Aren't I just a mean person? And to do things God's way, I have to die to some things that I like. Like, I'm, I'm like, okay, let me, Brooke just walked in, so I'll pick on her because she's late. So she likes to, and I've talked about this, she has certain things that she likes done. When you put things in the dishwasher, don't just throw it in the dishwasher any old way you please right? There is an order by which the things go into the dishwasher. How many of you are silverware up type of people, right? How many of you are silverware down type of people? Like, like the, you know, and it's like, and my wife, this is a really big deal for my wife. It's like, why are we putting the silverware down? How can it wash down in that little plastic tray that's netted looking? I know, I know, but you don't like it down. You like it up. You like it down? She's messed up. Like, I think you should put the dirty part up so it's free to get washed. Amen? I just feel like that's the appropriate way to do it. And so she has a way that she would like to see that done. In my relationship with her, there are some things, there are some compromises, there are some uh, things that to be in a relationship, it's a give and take. Amen? For some reason, in our relationship with God, we, we understand this in every area of our life. Like there are just some things that, and, and particularly in, in regards to authority, like, like my relationship with Brooks, one thing you're like, actually, it's going to be my way or it's going to be the highway. Actually, people say that. They really say it to their kids a lot. It's, listen, you're, I gave you life. I can take away your life. It's going to be my way or it's going to be the highway. And so that's kind of thing that we do. But in a relationship where there is reciprocity, and I believe that Jesus wants to function like this, that he wants us to, to be in a relationship with him, um, it, it just gets interesting. You know, there are, there are some things that we, we don't compromise our beliefs, but we submit them. 
That's why we're going to be a people that are submitted, amen? We're submitted to his lordship. We, don't, we understand this in every other area of our life with our teacher. Like if you're, you have a student in here today and you have a teacher, she's in authority over you, so she gets to choose what happens in her classroom. This is not confusing to us. Now, you may make fun of her behind her back and call her Miss Moffat who sat on a toffet eating her curds and whey, you know, whatever. Like I, had, I actually literally had a uh, teacher called Miss Muffet. Moffat. Miss Moffat. You're a, you have a Miss Moffat? You are a Miss Moffat? What? Oh, you were. Yeah, see? And my thing is, like, so, but even in teachers in school, you have to, you submit to that. In your workplace, your boss, you submit to the way, you you probably talk bad about him with the water cooler, but you submit to those things. In our relationship with God, for some reason, submission is lost on us because he asks us to do things that goes against what we desire. And we have, we have begun to preach a gospel, listen to me, in our world today, we have begun to preach a gospel that is telling people, Jesus is here to serve you and to bless you and to make your life comfortable. We're preaching a message like that in a lot of places. Many of us approach his word that way, that God is here to serve me and he is here to bless me and it's all about what Jesus does for me. We come to church, is we talk about, Healing. Yes, he wants to heal you. Yes, he wants you to be well. But everything in your life is not about you being healed and being well. Sometimes it's about you being effective. Are you with me today? Sometimes the things that we pray for aborts God's plan for your life. Are you willing to submit your prayers into the will of God? I think that's the great question. And we have a generation that, you know, we're living in a generation, and I think every generation is similar to ours. We're not special. But we're living in a generation, really, where we, we have the word, and God's, we, hear the, we hear the word, but are we listening to the word? I wrote this down in my bath musings, and I thought I would share this with you. Knowledge is not verified by what we profess but rather by what we produce. And in the church today, we have a lot of people that have become knowledgeable about the things of God, but are producing nothing. You want to know a sign if you're really hearing God in your life? What does your life produce? So let that sit for a second. What does your life produce? Because we have a lot of people, like, like we come on Sunday and you guys, you guys hear the word. There's not a short, you, you're, you're listening to it, but you don't hear it. I think there's a difference. And listen, I want you to understand, like my kids, they, they listen to me. It goes into their ear, but literally it goes right out the other side, out of the other ear. How many of you men listen to your wife when she's talking. (laughs) That's scary. Like there's moaning, but it's true. Okay, let me me ask the ladies because they don't have any problem ratting you out. Like, I don't understand. Like men are beat down. They they can't even have a voice anymore. They can't have an opinion. They're scared of the women. Let me tell you, I I ain't scared of y'all. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm scared of you too. Let me ask the women. How many times have you come into the living room while your husband's watching TV or on his phone or something, talk to him, have a whole conversation with him, and at the very end, you say, are you listening to me? And he goes, what? (laughs) Ladies, are you with me today? You hear the words that are coming out of your mouth, but you don't hear them. It hasn't impacted you. They're floating around the abyss. They do impact your ear, but there is no fruit coming from what you hear. Uh, Let's go to Mark. I I think that I'm going to put these together, and I think that it will help us. Listen, I understand that this sermon is not a bunch of shouting. It's not a bunch of all that. I'm giving you some things that I believe that God is trying to teach us. Ready? Matthew, Mark, what was it, four? Do you guys have it, the scripture up there? No? Hmm. Interesting. 4.28 says this. 
Mark 4, 28 says, for the earth yields crop. Actually, let me go back. Let me go back here. Let's see where we can go. Let's go to Mark 4. Twenty-two. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. That means there has to be a letting for hearing to really take place in our hearts. All right? Meaning that you can resist hearing. Are you with me today? If anyone has ears, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you shall hear. Let me me say it this way. You best be careful what you're listening to. You know what? I can sit down with somebody for a couple hours and I can ask them questions about their life. And I can know what they're listening to. I can know what's getting down into their heart by the choices they're making. Are you with me today? Let me ask you a simple question today. What choices are you making and what does your life look like? What have you given your life over to? That's the thing that you're inclining your ear to. Let me say this. There are, there are people who come into a relationship with Jesus right at the beginning and you'll... You, I will actually encourage them, you need a new circle of friends. And, and then there's all these challenging conversations I have with pastors, and it's, it's really kind of annoying. I don't, I don't think we mean to get into debates about this, but pastors are like, well, how are we ever going to make a difference for the world if we cut ourselves off from the world? Listen, there are seasons. <laughs> Every season is not a season of production. Sometimes there's a winter season. Sometimes there's a fall season. Our life has seasons too. And when you enter into a new season where you are born again in Christ, you need to be careful about the environment you put yourself into. Let me, let me say it this way. A new plant has to be consistently in the right environment to grow enough to survive bigger storms. This is why they create greenhouses. You know why you come on Sunday? It's to get into an atmosphere that is prayed for by the staff, by people in the church. It is good for you to be in an atmosphere that you don't have to make yourself, but to come into an atmosphere where you can have a moment to get a breath. An atmosphere produced for you so you see what that atmosphere looks like and you go reproduce it in your circle of influence. The point of coming here is not that you could stay here. We, we have people go to camp and conferences and want to stay at camp and conferences because they enjoy the atmosphere. You know why you enjoy that atmosphere? It's not because it's any different than any other atmosphere that's similar to it. It's because you didn't have to do nothing to get in that atmosphere. It was made for you. And God is calling us, not just the church, to create an atmosphere or a greenhouse effect where people can grow up into maturity. God is calling you to create that atmosphere in your home where your children can grow up into maturity. Okay, let me say it this way. I'm not off base. I know what I'm doing here. I said, just hold on. Now, my day consists of me. I'm in the office a lot. I'm at the hospital a lot. I'm meeting with people, I'm counseling people, I'm studying, I'm doing website stuff. That's why I do, I mean, do media stuff. I, I can't seem to get my hands out of the graphics. I enjoy it, right? And so I, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm dealing with financial stuff. We're dealing with planning and we're dealing with building stuff. And it's very interesting. And so that's my week. It, it's my week. And I deal a lot with people. I'm in conversations with people a lot. I'm in conversations with our staff a lot. Sometimes giving direction, sometimes receiving direction. <gasps> Shocking, isn't it? And, and so in these interpersonal relationships with other people, we, we, are, we put our best foot forward to create an atmosphere where people want to actually be here. Like, I want to create an atmosphere for our staff that they want to come to work. That helps. Yeah. Right? Right? I mean, I want that to be our atmosphere. So when they interact with me, they get the best me. 
I have talked to pastor's wife after pastor's wife after pastor's wife that will tell me that they get the worst of their husbands. Track with me now. They spend 90, 98% of their life creating an atmosphere, a greenhouse where everybody else can grow and then they go home and they let their hair down in their greatest mission field, their family. Are you with me today? Some of you come on Sunday. Do you, put your, do you let your hair down on Sunday or do you smile? And are you nice on that day? It's your two hours of niceness. And the rest of the day, you're gossiping, backstabbing, hateful, angry, getting mad at everybody that cuts you off on the road, calling everyone names. But at church for two hours, you give your best. If we're going to be the church, we have to take who we are at church and infiltrate the world. And we got to begin to change the atmosphere. And the atmosphere we sense here that's produced for you here, we need to produce in our world. You want to see suicide stop in Pleasant Hill? Be the light in Pleasant Hill. you got to do more than just come to church and get your good atmosphere on Sunday, and you need to begin to bring that atmosphere into your home, and it begin to change. And let, let me tell you, God will put a greenhouse effect over a city. But you have to do something about it. You've got to stop chasing conferences and chasing moments and chasing hours and chasing encounters with God, and you need to be Christ to the world. We chase Christ instead of become him. And let me tell you, you know what hearing? There is a famine in the land, and people are hungry. And, but there is not a shortage of bread, and there is not a shortage of water, and there is not a shortage of word. There is a shortage of us producing what we hear, of producing what we encounter, of us producing what we have experienced. We have been changed but for some people, they only see how we've been changed for an hour on Sunday. Can I just go ahead and propose this to be challenging and not to be offensive, but to be honest? If you only are changed on Sunday for an hour, you weren't changed. If it hasn't changed the way you walk at home, you ain't changed. You're putting on a show. And anybody can put on a show for a little while. And God is saying, have you... Heard me, like I could tell my boy, listen, I, I, like I tell my boy, before we, my boys, are, my, Ashton's staying home. Now, he tells me, he's, he's, he's mature, he's old, but I have a tendency, and I don't know if parents, I'm not picking on my son, he's a good, good son, he's obedient, but sometimes he goes in one ear and out the other. So this morning I said, make sure you take out the trash. Don't forget to take out the trash. Don't pile up the trash all the way to the ceiling. Take out the trash. Hey, make sure you take out the trash. And he got a little annoyed with me this morning. Because as a parent, I have said stuff like that before. Come home from a trip and trash is piled up to the ceiling. But it's one thing for me to say it, and it's another thing for you to take it to heart. He actually heard it, but he didn't take it to heart. And, and like I've given kids instructions, like my boys instructions. I, Landon, I give him instruction on how to use a knife. Don't cut towards you. <laughs> cut away from you. Am I preaching yet? But if you think you know better, you will, even though you heard me say, and you know that I said, don't cut toward you, and you know that that is something that I've told you not to do, if you think you know better, you will continue to do the opposite direction because you know better. And many of us hear the word, but we know better. Your life never changed. And this is the thing, there's no shortage of you hearing how you should live but you know better. Let me just drop this in there because this is the most offensive one. Like, you, you've heard a lot that you should tithe and make God Lord of your finances, but you know better. You know how to budget better. You know, you know what you need better. You know what bills you have better. And at the end of the day, you don't trust God because you know better. Are you with me today? I don't need your money. 
God needs your heart. It's simple as that. I just wish you'd get off the pre- tithing. I just wish you would tithe. <laughs> so that I could get off the tithing. And just like Paul says, I want to give you meat, but I keep having to give you milk because you can't even do the one thing I've asked you to do. Are you with me today? Like, I know it stinks. Like, I want to move on to some different type of preaching, but I can't. You know, it's like the whole thing. I, I, I don't know. I, I said this a bunch, but it's like, you're, you know, we go to these youth conferences and pastors, youth pastors are preaching the same thing they preached 50 years ago. This exact same thing. 50 years ago, they're preaching the same thing. Girls, keep your skirts down. Boys, keep your pants up. Don't dilly-dally around. Don't have sex before marriage. You know why we're still preaching that? Because you're still doing it. Because you know better. Because it won't hurt me. This won't affect me. Are you with me today? Like, it's funny, because when I talk about different stuff, people start squirming different. (laughs) And listen, God doesn't hate you. He loves you. But the reality is... The, the thing that prevents us from hearing is that we know better. And Ashton, Landon, finally, let me tell you, let me tell you this. This, this will be funny, right? And I know this is a laid back sermon, but I'm having fun, right? So Landon, you know when he stopped cutting backwards? You know when he stopped doing that? When he cut a chunk of his thumb off? He was like, oh, maybe I should cut the opposite direction. I'm going to hit you. <laughs> you think? You think I've been telling you that for the entire time since you got your first knife, I've been telling you. But something, like, and let me tell you, why do we want to be so stupid that we have to be hurt to be obedient? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Like, like I, I've actually had, I remember saying this to my parents. And you'll remember, too, because everybody's stupid like this, right? I remember saying this. I just want to learn it by myself. On my own. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I just want to make my own mistakes and I want to learn it on my own. <laughs> really? Really? Really do you? Really? And so I did. Let me tell you guys, young people, you know, I know, you don't listen to me. You think I'm stupid and old and don't know no better. I get it because I used to be you. I used to think everybody was stupid and old and didn't know better. And I actually thought, and listen, I'm 41 and I feel like I am 15. I know, it's shocking. I know you're looking at me like, yeah, right. You're ancient, like you're gray and old. You're falling apart and you're going to turn to dust. Like I remember that. I remember thinking that. But you should actually, if you think I'm old, then you probably will know what comes along with that, wisdom, and you should pay attention to what I'm saying, the words that are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> right? We have Richard and Sandy. They've been with us since the very beginning. And, and I know that Sandy's sweet and she smiles and you think that her only purpose is to serve you coffee. Have you asked her? If she could talk to you and speak into your life because she has more to give than just serving you coffee on Sunday morning. Oh, man. You know why we're asking you to go to a small group? Because we're trying to position you with other people who've been somewhere, who've experienced some stuff, who might actually bless you and help you be able to deter and get away from something that your dumb butt's going to get you into. And if you would hear somebody else who's been there, you might, not, you might avoid a, um, years of heartache because you actually listened and believed that what they said, they knew what they were talking about. Same people, listen, same age, same people repeating the same sin over and over and over again, generation after generation. And you know why? We, we are, as a church are failing because we're not helping young people get to a place where they don't do what we did so that they can be further than we are so that we can actually become a movement that does something beyond one generation. The, the, the movement of the church is not all that God intended to be. I'm just going to tell you right now. And the reason is because we can't, do, we can't do anything greater than one generation. Because as soon as that generation has accomplished all it's going to accomplish, the younger generation comes in and goes, trash. We're going to do it our way. You're doing it our way. You're doing it the same way we did. Just you're starting over at the beginning and doing all the dumb crap we did. You need to start where we're at. And you need to take it further. And you need to sit down, listen to me, young people. The best thing you can do for yourself, and parents, don't you dare lie to them. Because parents will lie. I'm just telling you right now. They'll do it. You've heard your mom yell at you. You know she'll go crazy on your butt. So you know it. You know it. And I'm 
tell you parents right now, listen to me. You, kids, you need to sit down with your parents and say, where did you fail? What sins did you struggle with? Parents, be honest. They need to hear how your choices have impacted your life in a negative way for years so that they don't repeat your dumb behavior. I'm not saying you're dumb, but we have some dumb behaviors. Right? I have. I have. I have. We need, to, we need to begin to impart wisdom when we're at home. We impart wisdom at work. We impart wisdom at church. We impart wisdom at our small group we lead. We impart. We impart wisdom with the women we hang out with, our friends and our family members, and then we come home and we let our hair down because we're tired, and our kids get the worst of us, and we don't pour into them because it's our time to be nasty, and it's our time to let loose, and it's our time to be frustrated because we hadn't had the right to be frustrated any other way, and you wonder why you're raising up a generation of ungrateful, un, un, let me tell you, ungrateful, ungrateful, angry, hateful, you know, um, uh, hates authority type of generation. We're raising them up because that's all we poured into them. They hear you talking about how your boss mistreats you and how you can't believe your boss and you're just, because you're coming home and you're letting your hair down. Are you with me today? They're listening and they're hearing, but they're not hearing from the best of you. They hear you when you come home and you give the worst of you. And you wonder why are, we wonder why are, we're losing our kids left and right to the church. You tracking with me here? What are you speaking? You will speak what you've heard. And it's really gotten down your heart. Listen to this. If we go on down, it says this. So it says, then he said, take heed that you hear with the same measure you use. So hearing is attached to usefulness. Meaning this. That, that hearing, we, we measure out what we believe to be true in our life. When truth impacts us, it affects the way we live. So it's saying, I need you to evaluate what you do in your life because then that will show what you're listening to. All right. Now if we go on down to verse, I don't know, I think it's... Uh, Verse 30 and 31. No, that's not it. Where is it at? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Verse 28 and 29. For the earth yields crop by itself. Listen to me. First the blade. Everybody say blade. So you put a seed in the ground. You cover it up with soil. You pour water on it. It takes a little while for the blade to go boop. First the blade. Then the head, everybody say head. I was talking about, then it grows a little bit more, then you have the head, then it says this, then the full grain in the head. Notice that the seed, the seed is in the head. Are you with me? The seed is in the head, but it takes time to produce a harvest. God is saying this, he's saying this, he's saying maturity Growing up into maturity is being a person that, that let me, let me, we, we talk about this. I'm going to say it this way. This, this will help us. We say this. We talk about evangelistic movements. And we say that the, that the fields are white for harvest. You ever heard that? The fields are, are ripe and they're white for harvest. And so we talk about evangelism or evangelists like Billy Graham going in and he's, he's, he is, uh, he's reaping. He's reaping a harvest. Listen, all those people that are just getting saved are not the harvest. Because it's first the blade, and then it's the head, and then it's the, then it's the grain in the head. Harvest happens in discipleship. It does not happen in evangelism. What this is, is sowing seed. Billy Graham was great at sowing seed. And then churches come in, grab people, and grow them up into a harvest. We got it all backwards. 
We're preaching a gospel that is not accurate. And many of us need to understand maturity. Like, you know what the difference between, you know what, you know what maturity is? Let me talk about this example. I gave the example of Landon with the knife. Maturity is not going, I, I, not learning from cutting your finger off. That's not maturity. That's stupidity. Maturity is, then the next time I tell him to do something that he thinks dumb, he does it even though he doesn't have a reason to do it or he doesn't understand why I've asked him to do it. He does it anyway. That's maturity. Where he has, doesn't have to be beaten into submission and learn the hard way, but he hears a word and he is a doer of the word. And it says in the Bible, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. He's, he's saying, you know what he's saying? Grow up into maturity. Stop hearing something that you're not going to do. That's stupid. He's calling us into maturity. Some of us want to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this blade and the head and the grain in the head. Like maturity, maturity, growing up into full maturity where it's ready for harvest, that harvest doesn't only produce food for people, it also produces seed for another harvest. You want to know how to go out into the world and, 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 and bless the world and to sow the fruits of the Spirit? Let me... You want to know how to do that? Grow up into maturity. And when God speaks something, you do something. It goes in your ear. Let me tell you, and you mature because you're mature because of your obedience to hear his word and do his word. And in that maturity, when you hear his word and do his word, you become a seed that can be sown to the world. Track with me now. Listen to me. You become a seed that can be sown to the world. The blade has no seed to sow to the world. The blade cannot make a difference in the world. The ear cannot make a difference in the world. But the grain in the ear, full maturity, we then become things that people can then can be benefit from and we can also become and expand the kingdom. Kingdom is seed. It is harvest time. It is those things. But I'm afraid today that we have, we have church believers that stay a blade their whole life. We learn, we, we're going to learn it our way. We're going to do it our way. We'll never grow up 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We never grow into greater folds. And none of us, and some of us live in church the entire time. We're saved. We're going to heaven. But we never, ever get to a place where we live in such a way where we hear his word and we do his word. So then we're, what are, we, we're not sowing anything to the world. You know the greatest form of evangelism is not going and talking to people because people don't listen to you anyway. If people listened... Church would be a minute point. It would be a purpose. It, this would be purposeless on Sunday morning if you listened. Because we would only have to say it one time and then we would have to never say it again. So evangelism isn't about you going and saying something. It's about you going and being something. Are you with me? Who you are shares the gospel greater than what you say. But many of us are the same we've always been since the day we got saved. And, and some of us are saved but still living like the devil. Okay. For the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts it in the sickle. Because the harvest has come. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close. Some of us are coming on Sunday morning to get a word. And we chase and listen to things all week to get a word. And the reality is we live in a generation that you can choose the word you want to get. And you can choose the voices that speak the word that you think is palatable. And that's dangerous. Are you with me today? 
So we chase a word that will meet our flesh and satisfy our soul, but will not guide our spirit, the spirit that God has put in us. And this is dangerous. We have a couple people in our church that are gifted in the prophetic. Do you know who they are? We have people that were a part of our church who are gifted in the prophetic, that are grow, have grown in their gifting beyond us. A couple of them would be, you know, and I have my own gifting. I have my own gift sets, but a couple of them would be uh, Tim Rufner. Very gifted in the prophetic and has learned how to manage it well. Adam Shirelli, when he was first here, he didn't even know what the prophetic was. But Adam Shirelli operates higher and higher levels of, of, of in the prophetic. Like, and there are people that will drive up to the coffee shop up in Lee Summit just to get a word from Adam Shirelli because God speaks through him. So we all have our own sets of giftings. Let me ask you a question. Have you been guilty of chasing a word from somebody but rejecting a word that God wants to speak to you? <laughs> we are chasing a word from people. And I'll be honest with you. It's no difference than paying $9.99 for a 900 number that you can get your word for the day or your reading for the week of whether you're going to get a man, whether somebody's going to die, or what your week's going to be like. It's no different than that. You're chasing a word that will edify your flesh. God doesn't want to edify your flesh. He wants to transform your flesh. The prophetic has its point. I'm telling you, it has its point. But its point is not that you would then begin to chase a movement. We have this guy um, called Caesar, and he's located in Kansas City. Many of our church has gone there to see what he would say to them, to see if he could really speak a word over their life. My question is, how come you're chasing to get a word from Caesar, but you can't even get a word yourself? You're like, well, that's why I go to Caesars because I can't get a word for myself. No, you're rejecting the word that God's given you because you don't like it. Are you with me today? Listen to me today. Am I against Caesar in Kansas City? I'm not. But I am against a people who will chase. Let me, let me give you a word. If God has given you a word and it does not require submission, it ain't from God. I don't care. Anybody can disagree with me. You're wrong, but you can disagree with me all you want. If you get a word from God, and you, because everybody's talking about, I got a word. I just got a word. God gave me a word, but it doesn't require submission. It ain't from God. It's from the devil. It's from a spirit. It's the wrong spirit. That's why we, listen, and, and look, people come to me all the time and say, well, I just can't hear God speak. No, you hear him speak. You don't like what he's saying. <laughs> and you can harden your heart and you can tighten your hearing where no you longer, you be, you no longer can hear him anymore because you've rejected what he said, you rejected what he said, you rejected what he said, you rejected what he said. And let me tell you, it isn't that he's speaking quieter, it's that you're moving further away from what he's calling you to do. And the more he presses you, the more you reject him. And he's trying to get you to a place where you will grow up into the full measure of Christ Jesus. But we don't want to grow up where we are beneficial for the world and we, we are bread for the world and we are sowing seed for the world and we're changing atmospheres for the world. We don't want to be mature. We want to do it our way. God, we got a better plan. We know how to do it better. God's spoken clearly in here about what we should and should not do. Many of you, although you don't know much about the word, you know because even if you don't read this, he's written it on your heart. He said he's written his law on your heart. So if you never open up the Bible, you know what's right and wrong. Because he wrote it on your heart. <laughs> Man. Let 
Maturity is not just hearing the word, but it's hearing the word and doing the word. Those that hear, we know who hears because we see what they do. 